Hello, my name is Dr. Don Park, and I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon here at UCLA, specializing in minimally invasive spine surgery. I am an assistant clinical professor in the UCLA Department of Orthopedic Surgery, and I'm also the vice chair of quality and safety for the department. I'm a member of the UCLA Comprehensive Spine Center in Santa Monica. Today I'll be talking about minimally invasive spine surgery, the state of the art. Please be sure to ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat or comment on Facebook. Minimally invasive spine surgery is uh, a small uh, subset of minimally invasive surgery as it's expanding rapidly in all surgical specialties, including general surgery, urology, and orthopedic surgery. There's an increased public interest and demand because patients would like to have surgeries that are less painful with smaller incisions. And there's a heavy uh, amount of marketing from surgeons as well as from industry that are creating products to allow uh, minimally invasive surgery to occur. Minimally invasive surgery has been uh, in orthopedics for many years. The concept of smaller incisions, less soft tissue injury, has, can lead to improved healing and early recovery has been well established in the orthopedic literature. In total joint arthroplasty, the incisions have grown smaller and there's more attention paid to meticulous tissue handling that then can help with reduced postoperative pain and functional recovery postoperatively. With the advent of computer assisted navigation, precise bone cuts can be made with small incisions that limit the visualization for the surgeon and still have great outcomes. In orthopedics, we're known for arthroscopy, where we can now place arthroscopic uh, cameras into shoulder joints, hip joints, knee joints, and even small joints of the foot, ankle, and hand. And we can do surgeries now with smaller incisions than were previously done with long incisions and increased pain and morbidity from the surgeries. We can reduce the complications and morbidity and improve outcomes. And many studies have shown that this occurs. For spine surgery, today there is a society for surgeons who are interested in minimally invasive spine surgery. And from their website, they even purport that advantages of minimally invasive surgery include less post-operative pain, quick recovery, reduced blood loss, less soft tissue damage, small surgical incisions, less scarring, improved function. And so to the patient and the public, we're promising that surgery can be better, faster, and, and you can be stronger after surgery. From the, surgeon, or from the patient's perspective, you know, patients expect to have surgery that'll help resolve their pain and symptoms so that they have little post-operative pain after surgery with a short hospital stay or even outpatient surgery. They want to have a quick recovery after surgery that has an easy rehabilitation so that surgery is least disruptive to their lives. From the surgeon's perspective, minimally invasive surgery is difficult. There is a very steep learning curve and it requires many cases to be done by the surgeon to feel competent in doing these surgeries because it is technically difficult. We have to make small incisions so that we can visualize what we are doing in surgery without actually visualizing it uh, anatomically. So that requires radiographic images to help us understand the anatomy. With the limited surgical exposure, then we have to be masters at the three-dimensional spinal anatomy when we are given oftentimes two-dimensional radiographic images to interpret and use in surgery. This leads oftentimes to increased surgical times and increased radiation exposure to both the surgeon, the OR staff, and the patient. <coughs> Traditional open surgery requires longer incisions because we have to look at the, uh, the spinal anatomy directly. We need to do extensive dissections and, and remove and detach the muscle attachments from the bone so that we can retract the muscles and directly visualize the anatomy so that we can do the surgery safely, accurately, uh, with, uh, without complications. With this, there's significant blood loss associated with traditional open surgery. 
Now the strategy of minimally invasive surgery is to reduce muscle injury so that there's less retraction. To avoid disruption of the paraspinal muscle attachment so that we're not detaching muscles from bone. Instead, we're splitting the muscle fibers uh, and going between the fibers uh, so that we can uh, go to the anatomy that we're uh, uh, targeting in surgery. <coughs> There are a wide spectrum of strategies that we can use for minimally invasive spine surgery, including minim, mini open uh, strategies where we use small incisions to place expandable small retractors so that we can visualize what we need to see for surgery, tubular strategies where we place fixed tubes uh, into the uh, surgical area uh, over the surgical pathology and perform surgery in that manner. And then percutaneous strategies where we make small two millimeter incisions and place an endoscope uh, camera into the area to visualize the, uh, the area of interest so we can perform the surgery. A very common and very successful surgery that we perform on a daily basis is microdiscectomy. A microdiscectomy is when we use a microscope to illuminate and magnify the area that we are doing surgery and remove the disc that is compressing nerves and causing symptoms. The way that we typically do this is a limited discectomy where only the herniated fragment and any loose fragments are removed that are compressing nerves. We don't remove fragments that are within the disc that are stable, that are not uh, uh, mobile. This leads to better pain relief and satisfaction from patients. However, because we don't remove all of the disc material within the disc, there's an increased rate of reherniation and possible reoperations. However, if we do a subtotal discectomy or remove more of the disc from the disc space and even discs that material that's not loose, then this leads to greater loss of disc height, greater disc degeneration, and perhaps consequences of that down the road. But the reherniation rate is lower. And these are all possible with minimally invasive techniques. Endoscopic discectomy has become very popular <coughs> in Asia and in some parts of the United States. Endoscopic discectomy is arthroscopy applied to the spine, where we make small two millimeter, three millimeter incisions and place a endoscopic camera into the area where we're going to do the surgery, find a disc herniation and remove the disc herniation that is compressing nerves. So instead of directly visualizing with our eyes, we're, we're using cameras to go into the areas where we need to do the surgery. This has led to significant improvements in pain and outcomes in multiple studies with reduced blood loss. However, it is associated with increased surgical time and also increased cost. And that is because it costs a lot of money to buy the endoscopic uh, equipment and all the specialized equipment used for this surgery. However, there's no difference in how patients do or complications associated with this surgery at two years as compared to microdiscectomy. So the question is, is this cost effective? Are we buying specialized equipment so that we can do the surgery that is equivalent to what is done already through small incisions so that we can make our incisions very small with two to three millimeter uh, uh, lengths but no difference in, in patient outcomes. Then there's laser spine surgery. Now this is all the rage and I'm asked every day in my clinic about laser spine surgery and if it applies to their particular case. Laser spine surgery was developed by non-surgical specialists who put a catheter, catheter or needle into the disc and placed a laser probe that then heats up the disc material and shrinks it in a controlled manner. However, they are unable to remove any discs that are, that are extruded or popped out into the spinal canal and compressing spinal nerves. <coughs> As you can see on the right image here, this is an extruded disc fragment where the disc material has come out into the canal compressing nerves. And so a laser cannot remove that. A surgeon has to go in there and physically remove that disc material that's compressing on the nerve. And because of its proximity to the nerves, you risk having nerve damage if you aren't visualizing what you're doing. On the image on the left, there is a disc protrusion or a bulge of that disc with disc degeneration. You can see the darkness of this disc relative to the other discs above it. There's no compression here. 
And so this is something that occurs commonly, where we have contained disc protrusions. So laser spine surgery is indicated for contained disc protrusions, like this image right here. And multiple studies have shown that protrusions are uh, not very uh, responsive to surgery, and surgery is not very effective in, tr in helping patients who have disc protrusions. By that logic, laser spine surgery may not be effective in this case. Recent uh, randomized control trials uh, done uh, has compared laser spine surgery with conventional discectomy, and they found no short-term differences. However, they have also shown higher levels of back pain and leg pain after one year from the procedure in one study, and in another study, higher levels of back pain and reoperations one year uh, after surgery. There are no studies looking at cost-effectiveness of this uh, procedure. And from all of this, the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians do not recommend uh, uh, this procedure or give no recommendation based on limited evidence. From all of these factors, major insurance carriers do not cover laser spine surgery, so that leaves the burden, the economic burden, of this procedure to the patient. Minimally invasive decompression has been done with great success in lumbar stenosis. In this procedure, we can use tubes or specialized retractors to uh, decompress the spinal canal uh, and from a one-sided approach. We're able to bring in our instruments and perform surgery from one side, only uh, affecting one side of the spine, yet decompressing the entire spinal canal. And we can do that with uh, special equipment, tilting the OR table and tilting the operating microscope so that we can see what we need to see uh, and perform the surgery effectively. Now this has been shown to have improved outcomes, but again, Due to the limited uh, visualization from the smaller incisions, it has this very steep learning curve, and there's possibility of complications. There's an increased risk for incomplete decompression because we don't visually verify that we can decompress the spinal canal completely. In addition, dural tears can occur where we have a spinal fluid leak that then could affect the patient postoperatively. So this is something that does take time to master. Minimally invasive lumbar fusion is also a very uh, uh, advantageous uh, 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 technique as compared to open technique in many ways. But there are disadvantages, including increased radiation exposure. Since we're using imaging, radi radi uh, radiographic imaging, to understand our spinal anatomy so that we place screws into the correct place so that we can reduce our complication and still uh, 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 promote fusion. It also increases operative time because it takes longer to, uh, to perform this procedure if you don't have the workflow in mind with your operating room staff, your uh, x-ray technician, and uh, uh, everyone involved with the surgery. However, it has been in, in, uh, associated with reduced blood loss, reduced blood transfusions, reduced pain medicine requirements after surgery, earlier ambulation, and shorter hospital stays. <coughs> And this is all improved short-term outcomes for the patient. However, long-term, there's no difference in how patients do in terms of pain or outcome, and there's no difference in fusion rates. So there is no long-term difference, but there's obvious short-term benefits. And these are several examples of what can be done with minimally invasive techniques for fusion. We can do single-level fusion, where we address just the level that's affected with a minimally invasive cage that's placed with screws and rods to hold that in place. Or we can do multi-level uh, fusions where we can go at different levels and place screws and rods to hold everything in place. And you can even do scoliosis surgery with the def uh, complex deformities using minimally invasive techniques and be able to correct the scoliosis and deformity, maintain it with the fusion and the pedicle screw and uh, 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 rod construct. So these pedicle screws can be placed percutaneously through s multiple small incisions using the muscle splitting approach, using x-ray, like you see here, during surgery to be able to place these screws in the correct corridor of bone without having complications and still be able to have the same long-term uh, benefit. 
There is also uh, an emerging uh, field of uh, expandable cage technology where titanium cages are inserted in a collapsed state using minimally invasive techniques into the disk space and then expanded once it's in its final position and this can help to improve disk height as well as reduce any deformity and uh, uh, any slippage of the spine and, and promote fusion. Uh, so this can be uh, uh, combined with the uh, pedicle screw and rod fixation uh, to improve outcomes uh, that has been shown to be better than st uh, conventional static cages alone. So this is another tool that we can use uh, with minimally invasive techniques so that we can accomplish the goals of surgery and have a great surgical outcome. <coughs> A very popular uh, and uh, advancing, rapidly advancing uh, field in minimally invasive surgery is image guided surgery. And that's when we use advanced intraoperative imaging technology such as three dimensional fluoroscopy or x-ray technology um, or CT based, CAT scan based uh, technology within our operating room uh, that uh, we can use for the surgery. So these uh, imaging uh, technologies acquire the images that we need that then are fed into this computer that then can reconstruct images like this so that the surgeon can then see uh, in uh, multiple planes uh, the, the trajectory, the start point, and the ultimate placement of the pedicle screws uh, during surgery. And there are different uh, brands and uh, uh, various uh, systems available that hospital systems and uh, hospitals are using uh, to uh, um, uh, accomplish uh, uh, surgery. Now, these systems are expensive. You know, they run in the hundreds of thousands of dollars that the hospital and the hospital system uh, uh, has to pay for for these surgeries. So what are, th what are the results? What are the advantages of image-guided surgery? Well, the, a big advantage is that zero radiation exposure to the surgeon and the operating room staff. We are exposed to radiation hundreds and thousands of times in our careers and lifetime as we do these surgeries since we use uh, radiation and radiographic imaging to do our surgeries. And to protect ourselves, we have lead uh, gowns and, and the lead thyroid shields so that we don't have too much radiation exposed to ourselves during surgery. For the patient, they're exposed to the radiation because the, uh, we need to acquire the radiographic images. <coughs> and it's been measured that the exposure is less than the exposure uh, that naturally occurs from the environment per year for one of uh, these uh, 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 O-arm uh, or uh, uh, 3D fluoroscopy guided uh, imaging techniques. It amounts to about half the exposure of a typical spine CT that many patients do get routinely to evaluate uh, for spine conditions. And about 10% of maximum occupational exposure limit per year uh, for a single exposure of uh, the OR. What are the results? The studies show that there's improved accuracy of screw placement that ranges from 96 to 99% accuracy. So we can place screws where there's difficult anatomy, where it's altered and atypical anatomy, especially in places where it's very dangerous to place screws, such as the upper cervical spine, and in places where x-ray is difficult to penetrate, such as the upper thoracic spine, because the ribs and the shoulders get in the way. And so it's difficult for us to do those um, uh, areas uh, safely without these techniques. However, it leads to increased surgical times. It takes longer to acquire the images <coughs> using the O-arm or CT-based imaging. <coughs> and uh, the, the studies have shown that there's no difference in how patients do in terms of screw revision, reoperations, or neurological injury rates as compared to the standard uh, freehand technique using fluoroscopy. The big advantage in my mind would be that you can reduce the reoperations that are required because of misplaced screws. So if the accuracy is 96 to 99 percent and we know that uh, intraoperatively during surgery, then it will help reduce any reoperations that occur. But interestingly, the studies have not shown that to be the case. <coughs> so the question remains, 
does the cost uh, justify uh, the use of image guided surgery and computer assisted navigation if the uh, clinical results are the same as using standard fluoroscopic images. Now there is an advantage in terms of marketing where we are marketing uh, to patients that we use computer assisted navigation or image guided surgery to help improve our outcomes and so that helps to uh, promote our practices, promote our hospitals so that patients can have a better uh, 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 accurate surgery. <coughs> A burgeoning field within minimally invasive surgery is robotic spine surgery. And there's different tiers of robotic spine surgery based on the level of autonomy that we give uh, the robots. The, the first tier is a fully autonomous system where the robot is programmed with predetermined actions that are programmed by the computer or by the surgeon and that the robot simply carries out those actions with full autonomy and close surgeon supervision. Then there's also systems where the surgeon is in complete control of the robot from a remote station um, like the da Vinci robot that is used in general surgery and neurology uh, and is, is, is popularized uh, uh, in hospitals these days. <coughs> there's also the shared control system where there's co-autonomy where the surgeon and the robot can work simultaneously so that uh, um, we can perform the surgery. And typically in robots uh, surgery, this is the system that we are using in spine surgery where we have uh, the surgeon and the robot working together yet the, the surgeon has the ability to uh, uh, counteract whatever the robot says to do. Robotic spine surgery basically builds upon the principles and techniques of minimally invasive surgery with small incisions and using computer assisted navigation. <coughs> We're simply building upon it and it's the next layer. We're using the images that we get uh, from the O-arm or CT-based uh, 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 technologies. That we feed it into the computer. And then the robot takes that information and places its robot arm into the, the trajectory that we, it needs to be to place that screw in a precise and accurate manner. It places it in the correct start point and so that the surgeon only needs to then drill and place the screw um, using the guide that the robot arm has placed in the correct position. Well, studies have shown that the accuracy is quite high, 96 to 99 percent accuracy in terms of placement of the pedicle screw. However, this is equivalent to computer assisted navigation, and we're talking about cost. So, the computer assisted navigation with the image guided surgery is several hundred thousand dollars, and the cost of the robot can cost up to a million dollars. So the total bill at the end of the day for the hospital to hospital system can be extremely high. And it may not reduce surgical complications or reoperations. So the question is, is this cost effective? Many hospitals and hospital systems use this as a marketing ploy so that they bring in patients uh, so that uh, they would come to their hospitals for surgery. Robots are like lasers. It, it, it uh, captures the imagination of the patient to make you feel like we're doing advanced surgery in the 21st century and that uh, your, your surgery outcomes will be improved because of this. <coughs> However, the studies have shown that it may not make a difference, but it is very cool. So is spine, minimally invasive spine surgery here to stay? In my opinion, yes, definitely. It is a, it's a very valuable tool in my toolbox, but it's not the only tool that I have. And I look to it to see if I can uh, apply minimally invasive techniques to my patients so that I can optimize their surgical results. There are proven short-term benefits such as reduced blood loss, reduced hospital stay, reduced pain medication requirements. So your post-operative recovery will be easier than traditional open uh, uh, surgery. However, the long-term outcomes are the same. So as long as we take care of the patient and do the right thing and take care of the right uh, diagnosis and accomplish the goals of surgery, then it really shouldn't matter uh, if we have a small uh, incision versus a very long incision. Uh, as long as we uh, take care of the patient, we will have great uh, surgical outcomes. Please be sure to ask any questions on Twitter and on Facebook if you have any questions. Thank you very much for your attention.
I'll take any questions. So the first question is, what are the risks for spine surgery versus chiropractic adjustments? So chiropractic adjustments are uh, part of the non-surgical uh, treatment options, and uh, chiropractic treatments uh, uh, require manipulation of the spine to help uh, uh, with pain and symptoms. And this is generally uh, okay to do as long as you're not doing it for uh, disc herniation, where you can have more disc pop out, or for the cervical spine, especially in uh, older folks who may have uh, uh, spinal cord compression. Uh, there have been case reports of uh, neurological issues that are, arise from uh, uh, chiropractic treatments uh, with uh, certain types of situations. And so that may be something that you uh, uh, want to discuss with your uh, spine specialist on a case-by-case -case basis. <clears throat> the risks of surgery are always bleeding, infection, wound problems. Now with smaller incisions, that's reduced. And then we can give antibiotics before and antibiotics after surgery to help reduce that even further. There's always a chance for nerve damage, but with these techniques, oftentimes we are using neuromonitoring that we can then uh, detect if the uh, screw is causing any neurological uh, uh, issues and during surgery, so that if we need to, we can place the screw in a different trajectory or in a different way to help reduce that uh, from occurring. And then there's always a chance, like I said, about incomplete uh, decompression uh, incom uh, or a spinal fluid leak. Uh, and that always uh, is a risk of spine surgery. And neurological deterioration can occur, but it's a very low uh, risk of that happening. It depends on the uh, condition and the surgery that we're performing. The, the next uh, part of the question is generally at what point is surgery necessary? Surgery is necessary if there is a surgical indication for uh, the uh, problem at hand. And so not all uh, uh, conditions have a surgical indication. And if they, there is a surgical indication where there's pathology that makes sense that uh, would, would uh, uh, be benefited from surgery, then they have to fail non-operative treatment options first and have surgery as a last resort. So you still need to go through pain medications, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, epidural steroid injections or pain injections by a pain specialist. You can try acupuncture, even the chiropractic treatment if, if it's appropriate. Uh, massage and anything you can to try to get your pain better as, as best as you can. And if it is still limiting your, your, your lifestyle and you're have, you're, you feel as though you're having a difficult time in your day-to-day -day life with your function, then surgery may be indicated. But that's really a, a discussion between a spine surgeon and, your, and the patient. <coughs> <coughs> the next uh, uh, question is, uh, you know, can uh, laser spine surgery work for my condition. And uh, like I said in my presentation, not all uh, 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 techniques work, and especially with laser spine surgery, um, you know, it's, it's mainly indicated for contained uh, disc protrusions, and many studies have shown that those do not really respond well to uh, 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 surgery. And so perhaps laser spine surgery may not work for the condition at hand. Does minimally invasive spine surgery apply to everyone? No, not necessarily. Sometimes you need to have the open technique uh, based on the pathology that uh, we're dealing with. And so, uh, you know, the first question I ask is, uh, what is the problem? And then, what can I, how do I deal with that problem? And are there ways that I can deal with it through minimally invasive techniques? And if it takes more open techniques to do the surgery in a, in a, with better uh, results, then I would do that. Thank you very much for all your questions and I appreciate your attention.